The Greek word daimon, or in its plural, daimones, originally refers to a class of intermediate divine beings, sometimes translated as gods with the understanding that they're lesser gods, but more often translated as spirits or powers. The name daimon did not originally carry negative connotations. A daimon was a powerful spiritual being with its own aims and agenda, and so of course one had to know what kind of daimon one was dealing with and how to do so with care, but it was not necessarily understood as a malevolent entity. The Greek word daimon becomes in Latin daimon and in English demon. As is well known, it is Christianity that largely demonized the daimon, which is to say it figured this ambiguous class of intermediary beings as uniformly evil, often explaining them as fallen angels. You might say that the ancient Mediterranean world had a vividly colored world of intermediary beings and that Christianity is largely responsible for reducing that world at best to a grayscale and more often to a sharp contrast between black and white. Between humans and the one and only God, there exists only angels and demons, and they are good or they are evil. Now, our topic today is the double self, which I take to be the notion that whatever we understand the essence of the human being to be, that that essence is somehow doubled, bilocated, one and yet two. Several years ago, I published a book on this topic called Our Divine Double, in which I tried to trace the idea through ancient philosophy, especially Platonism, early Christianity, and Manichaeism. It was an idea that seemed particularly attractive in the early centuries of our common era. If you imagine the discourses of demons and of doubles as two circles, as you see on your handout, they do in fact overlap, and the convex space created by the intersection of their two arcs is called in geometry a lens. If we look through that lens, we see one figure standing out among many, the figure of Socrates. More than anyone else, Socrates is responsible for joining the discourses of demons and doubles. For it is Socrates, at least as he's portrayed by Plato in the Apology, who describes himself as having a demonic double, a semeon or divine sign that is phonic rather than phanic that is a voice rather than an appearance, and one that tells him no rather than yes. Today I want to introduce one of the many philosophers after Plato who tried to make sense of Socrates' demonic double and the relevance for the rest of us. The author in question is the second century Latin uh, writer Apuleius, Apuleius, I'm sorry, author of a short treatise called De Deo Socrates, or On the God of Socrates. So last night over dinner, Luis suggested that I try to state my contribution at the outset in case I go on for too long and Ulf cuts me off. So here goes. (laughs) What interests me most in Apuleius in the end is his claim that philosophy is and must be a kind of demonology. Not that philosophy has to take up demons as a philosophical topic like metaphysics, epistemology, or ethics but some, rather that the love of wisdom itself begins and ends with demons, specifically two demons, the demon that is your soul and the demon that is your double. So the question I will leave you with is simply, what would it mean for philosophy to take Apuleius seriously? So what does Apuleius have to teach us about demons? Three things. First, that they occupy a middle position between the immortal gods and humans, both in terms of status and in terms of space. The gods remain far removed from human contact and the taint of matter. With gods and humans separated, nature runs the risk of becoming, quote, two separate parts with, um, I'm sorry, gaping, discontinuous, and as it were, disabled. The suture of this cosmic wound is this third class of beings, quote, certain intermediate godlike powers. These, Apuleius says, these the Greeks called demons, and it is they who convey our prayers to the gods and the gods' gifts to us, as it were ambassadors and goodwill messengers for both. So much for their middle position. The second point Apuleius makes is that demons' element is the air. 
We might think that the air was the domain of the birds, but in fact, birds are earthly beings who have come to learn to fly. Unlike birds, demons are fully in and of the air. Their elemental nature matches their middle position. Their bodies have enough weight to prevent them from rising to the heavens, but not so much that they sink to the earth. They're more refined even than clouds, which, like birds, are earthly bodies that float for a time in air, but eventually return to their source. Demons, by contrast, quote, and I believe this quote is on your handout, coalesce out of that clear, calm element of the purest air, and hence are not readily visible to any human, unless by divine favor they permit themselves to be seen, since they do not have an earthly solidity that will necessarily meet our gaze and make it linger. Rather, their bodies are made of such sparse, light, fine strands that their sparsity transmits all the rays of our vision, their brightness dazzles them, their fineness eludes them. Demons have what we might call subtle bodies, exceedingly fine and difficult for our senses to perceive. We have to attune our senses differently or awaken other senses if we're to perceive them at all. The third feature of demons is that they are emotional. Safe in their vertiginous heights, the gods are untouched by the affairs on earth, quote, free from all passions of the mind. When the poets speak of the gods' love or hatred of humans, their pity or resentment for us, their joy or sorrow, they're speaking figuratively. These emotions or passions are felt not by gods, but by demons. Again, this befits their middle position between gods and humans. Gods are immortal and without emotion. Humans are mortal and emotional. Demons, between the two, are immortal and also emotional. So, to define them comprehensively, Apuleius writes, quote, demons are living beings by species, rational ones by nature, emotional in mind, aerial in body, eternal in time. Now, where should we expect to meet a demon? In fact, you need not look far, for your own human soul still residing in your body is itself a demon. When the Greeks call certain humans blessed eudaimones, it's because his or her soul is a good demon, eudaimon. That is, he has a mind of perfect nature. When we die, our souls are released from our bodies and become demons, recognizable demons, spirits who once occupied a human body. Because our souls are in fact demons, then all three points I just noted regarding demons also apply to us, at least after we die. We will occupy a middle position, our element will be air and our bodies subtle, and we will remain emotional. <laughs> Sorry, that, if you were looking for a release from that, I'm afraid not. <clears throat> but there's a second class of demons, which uh, Apuleius calls higher and more venerable, not fewer in number, but far superior in rank. Those who have never been shackled to an earthly body. Some such demons are general demons and they're responsible for certain functions. Examples he gives are demons of sleep and demons of love. But other demons are, quote, particular demons who are set over particular persons to be witnesses and guardians in the course of their life. Having a demon of this second sort is the equivalent of having a divine double, but it's a specifically demonic double, something like a guardian angel, ever present but invisible, observing all our thoughts and actions. When we depart from this veil of tears, the demon drags our soul before the judgment seat of uh, the divine judgment seat and stands witness as we plead our case, ensuring that we tell the truth. So on this model, there's no hiding from the demonic double. It knows every secret, every thought and every action. It dwells in the very recesses of your mind as conscience does. If you give it proper attention and even worship, it will guide you through life's travails. Apuleius writes, it alerts you in uncertainty, forewarns you in doubt, protects you in danger, supports you in need by dreams or omens, or perhaps in person if the situation demands or perhaps in person, if the situation demands. It can sweep away what is evil and promote what is good, raise up what is dark, guide success and undo failure. He then gives a long litany of names for this class of demons, which I won't bother to read, but it's in your handout there. 
So this is where the discourses of the demon and the double overlap. Each of us is a demon in the sense that our own human soul is a demon. And some of us, at least, also have a demon in the sense that one of the spirits who never descended into embodiment pairs up with our individual demon soul. If we're so fortunate, then we, are, we both are a demon and have a demon. So the most famous demonic double, of course, is Socrates' own, the Deo in this work's title, the Deo Socrates, the famous daimonion of whom Socrates speaks at length in Plato's dialogue, The Apology. Apuleius departs from Plato's treatment and insists that a demonic double not only says no, as Socrates' demon always did, but can also say yes. And that a demon double also not only speaks with a voice, but can appear to the eyes, precisely as the kind of disturbance of the air that Apuleius described earlier. But what strikes me as most interesting in Apuleius' uh, treatment is the concluding exhortation to philosophy and its entanglement with demonology. He tells us that we should not tout our birth, our wealth, our physical prowess, or our good looks, what he calls our externals. But instead, we should show care, cultus, for our demon, which means devotion or sacramentum to philosophy. So let me just say that again. Our oath or devotion to philosophy, to the love of wisdom, goes hand in hand with the care or cult of our demon. And there's an important ambiguity here in, in, in which, uh, what, which demon is ours exactly. So what care or cult might be required? If the demon that's ours is just our individual soul that's sojourning in this earthly body, then the cult of our demon means the care of that soul. Acknowledging our individual soul as a demon means recognizing its middle position between gods and humans, a suture between incommunicable realms. It means recognizing its airy nature and its tumultuous emotions. So one question is, what kind of cult is required to care for our demon soul? And if the demon that is ours is also the demon double who pairs up with our individual soul, then to care for that soul requires that we first meet it, that we encounter it. So another question is, what kind of cult is required to meet our demon double? Apuleius does not answer either question, but he does suggest that philosophy begins and ends with two demons, your soul and its double. So, for Apuleius, philosophy is a sacramentum, a devotion or an oath. In ancient Rome, a sacramentum was a oath in which you, the oath giver, give yourself to the gods, perhaps in the case of philosophy, to the goddess Sophia, or wisdom. And for Apuleius, to make such an oath also commits you to a cult or worship, the care and cultivation of these two demons. The question I wish to ask you is, can we imagine philosophy once again taking up this demonic dimension? What would it look like if it were to do so? And where would we see it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did Socrates believe that his diamond was this half god made of air and emotion? I've always thought that it was more his own, his own inner voice, his conscious, the situation we ever ha all come to. We know we want to do something, we know we shouldn't, and something says, don't do it. Mm. I, I've, is that Socrates' demon more? Socrates, we don't have Socrates' own words, of no. course, so we have just reports on it. Yeah. And, but many people have tried to assimilate Socrates' <coughs> demon to the notion of conscience. Um, it it's, not, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough. And the other place that Plato speaks about the daimon as he says the god Eros is also a daimon. And there, he says, Eros is this spirit that connects humans to the gods. Mm -hmm. But you're, that means connecting two dialogues, the apology and the symposium to make that. Account. And how do demons relate to, to the devil and the underworld? Because well, sometimes mm. we say demonical, I mean, it's devilish. Yes. 
Uh, that's another lecture about the origin yes, of please. the devil. No, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to give that. Uh, that gets us deeper into the history yeah. of Christianity um, and some singular adversary. There's no adversary here. There's no singular. So the devil comes into play much later. Uh, yes, yeah. and not in this Greek idiom. Hmm? See you later. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> 